If you're new to our channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. We're going to talk about vegetables that you can grow economically that are quite expensive at the grocery store. As well as berries, berry bushes, berry patches, what is best for you and maybe it doesn't work for you at all. And we have blogger and author Todd Heft as our guest. As well as your garden questions and our garden answers. All that starts right now. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show on 860 AM WNLV and W293CX 106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether through those stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, or anywhere in between, we are live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and happy that you have joined us this morning. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is the website that contains over 1,100 garden videos, as well as short and long format, as well as uh, full-length in-studio video and podcast form of this program, as well as segments. There's a number of ways in which you can contact us during the next hour. Uh, one is the Ivy Organic 3 one Plant Guard Hotline. Ivy Organic 3 one Plant Guard naturally protects against damaging sunburn, insects and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, or ornamental trees and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. You can call in any time during the show with your question or comment to 414-444-5250. As well as you can text or uh, tweet us at our Twitter handle is TWVGshow. Uh, you can also uh, send us an email anytime at TWVGshow at gmail.com. Or if you want to sign up for a weekly email, you can certainly do that by texting TWVG to 345-345, and we'll get you set up on that. Uh, we want to welcome those who are listening because they found us through On Milwaukee. On Milwaukee released a story about us this past Wednesday, uh, acknowledging our second season here on the on the radio. Uh, we want to thank Molly and the team over there for uh, writing that up and posting that and letting all of you know that we are here. And then last week we forgot to mention, because we were in West Dallas the week before, we forgot to welcome those that came to our talk on seed starting. And we have uh, we the West Bend talk this last week had to be canceled. They were having some sewage issues. Yeah. Um, and then we have two talks this week. Yeah, we go uh, to uh, Slinger on Tuesday where we talk about straw bell gardening as well as way up north to Kohler on Thursday about tomato uh, growing, growing the best tomatoes. Now, if you want to, uh, we'll, ha- we'll have those talks locally as well. If you want to find out where we will be, where you might be, you can find that under the radio t- or the Come See Us tab. On our website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, we've still got about 27 more talks here in the Milwaukee area that you can be part of and uh, learn. So uh, every uh, why, why do we garden? To save money and to grow healthy, right? Definitely. I think um, that's part of the reason why, why we garden is to save money, to grow healthy. It's a relaxing hobby, and the cheapest crops to grow are typically the most expensive to buy. Right. We're going to go over a number of crops here that you can grow very easily in your garden, your containers, your raised beds that can um, be purchased at the store. It it can be costly. Even if you are uh, buying at the farmer's market, there are some expenses, you know, that you have to endure, but you can grow it very easily. And everything we are going to talk about can be grown in a container. So that's the nice part or a raised bed or a, a pop up raised bed things right. like that. So let's go with the most obvious one for most people who garden is herbs. Right. Well, herbs are if you if you buy them dry or you buy them fresh at the at the store. Especially fresh. If you go to any store, no matter what store it is, no matter how low their prices are, you buy those fresh herbs, they're still expensive. And, and you get like one, I don't know, a few ounces for a lot, you know, several dollars. Right. Well, not several dollars, but still, it's definitely something that if you want fresh herbs, you you are better off uh, growing them yourself. And we grow them in our window. Yeah, in- inside. You can grow these yeah. inside year-round: basil, thyme, sage. Um, cilantro is kind of iffy with the the indoor, but it can be done. Um, rosemary. Rosemary. We've got a rosemary plant that we started from seed, what, two years ago now? Mm-hmm. Uh, and we bring it outside every year and then bring it in during the winter. So herbs can be, if you have nothing else but a south-facing window, a east or a west-facing window, or somewhere in that range, you can grow herbs very easily indoors. And then, yeah, some of these herbs can be prolific, can put a lot of foliage on. 
you can clip those off and dry those. Right, and then you just kind of grind them up or uh, put break them, them up. Put them in a, a mason jar with a lid on it. Right. But you want to make sure they're dry, obviously, before you do that. Otherwise, you're going to have mold. But that's definitely a good option. So then we have leaf lettuce and any any leafy green, really. Um, those, you can, you'll find, like, big packages of spinach or uh, mixed greens, things like that, people put in their smoothie, and they run anywhere from, like, 3 to $5, and you can just grow your own. Now, this is a cool weather crop, which means as the days get longer, the plant will go into a reproductive or go to bolt and when it's when i say bolt that means a reproductive state that it's not going to be edible anymore right and lettuce is like 90 percent water or something so you can grow it yourself or you can i can't believe how much lettuce costs sometimes at the store if it's not on sale it's like what are you paying for the trick to growing that leaf lettuce or romaine lettuce uh to get it to last longer during the season grow it in a partial shade area that mimics the day length not being as long, and that tricks the plant thinking, oh, I'm still in the earlier portions of the year. I'll still put on natural leaf growth instead of reproductive uh, seeds uh, going to bolt. So that's another one in which you can grow very easily. Uh, broadcast, you know, four or 500 leaf lettuce seeds in a, raised, uh, in a container, a five or seven or eight-inch pot. Uh, intensely plant. Don't go off the spacing. Just broadcast until you can't see the soil. Dust it with soil, water, and you're going to have a forest of leaf lettuce. More leaf lettuce than you know what to do with. Right. For pennies on the dollar. Right. So one one is another one is garlic, and garlic, you know, might seem cheap at the store sometimes. You can spend up four or five dollars right. for a couple but of heads. Uh, if you want clothes. good garlic, good garlic, yeah. Um, and you grow, it, and it's just stupid easy to grow. You put it in the ground in the fall, and then in the spring you. You can fertilize it a little bit, then you cut your escapes off after they um, come about, and then a few weeks later you can harvest it. We are going to, and there are people that do successfully grow garlic from spring to fall. We've never attempted to do that, so we are going to uh, experiment with that this year. We've got a small bed in the garden where we're going to plant spring garlic and mimic the same character and, and do everything just the same, but as if it was in the fall so we're going to do that people do it very successfully so it's not like you can't but we have found that that october through june is the most successful portion and and once you uh, you want to get good garlic seed stock the the clove you want to get a, a actual variety you just don't want to buy the el cheapo stuff you get from the grocery store that come from asia typically that have uh, that's a that's a plain flavor and really no flavor in some instances once you initially buy your stock uh, we never needed to buy stock ever again since 2012, but we chose to bring in some new varieties into our garden. You can repeat and regrow that same garlic year after year. Uh, we grow somewhere between 75 and 100 cloves of garlic each year for virtually nothing. We say the largest cloves from the previous year, plant them in the fall the following year. We harvest it in June, so we save them, and then we plant in October. And you're just, you got more garlic than you know what to do with. Uh, so garlic, people can do it in containers. That is kind of the, the, the exclusion to all of what we're speaking about. It can be done in containers, but really it's best just throw it in a, a flower bed, a side bed next to the house. You don't have to have it in an actual garden. It'll grow anywhere. Right. That's what I'm saying. It's super just dumb, easy to grow. Uh, so peppers, depending on the time of year, you can find some bell peppers for reasonable price i bought some the other day it was four for five or one for dollar 49 right so, so that's really not that good of a deal i mean it's, it's obviously that's in okay. february march okay but still uh you can grow these very very affordably you can also pickle them you can can them pickle them you can also freeze them mm -hmm. and you can have them all year round um especially if you like hot peppers or maybe you you want to grow hot peppers don't they you... call those hotheads like people who like the hot peppers I, I forget what the term is but, but, but there are youtube channels that strictly are focused on growing the hottest pepper and then having uh pepper challenges and to seeing how if you can consume these peppers that are very very hot right so it's, that's not for me but no. um if you are if you are a hot pepper fan and you want a hobby like being a hothead i guess if that's the correct term then definitely you're you're it's good to grow your own because yep. you can grow a different variety and um, 
you can save some money. One to, based on what type of pepper and how you want to do it, one to two peppers in a five gallon bucket works fine. So you can get you know a good amount of peppers in, an, in a small area. It's not like you need feet and space. You know, right? Yeah, they don't, take, up, they don't take up a ton of space, and they're they're I think they're pretty little plants, personally. It, yeah. So tomatoes are. Um, I'm not talking about the El Cheapo bland tomatoes at the grocery store because you can buy tomatoes decently cheap. But if you want a nice, flavorful tomato, What we're used to. What we're used to. What you're used to growing up to, what you remember as a child a tomato should taste like. This is what we're speaking about. Right. Or if you, like, for example, cherry, t- cherry tomatoes or grape tomatoes, I bought some last night, a pint of them for $2. That's not really that good of a deal. But I enjoy but them, so I'm that's I'm willing to pay the price in March when I know in a few months I'll have my own. But yeah, definitely if you if you enjoy a certain type of tomato, like a cherry grape tomato for snacking, you're definitely gonna save some money there. And and we're gonna talk about in a couple of weeks how to successfully grow tomatoes, but we grow forty five different varieties of tomatoes and we can a ton of tomato juice, uh whole to- or, uh, sliced tomatoes. Uh, pizza sauce, salsa. We can a lot of stuff. Definitely. With the tomatoes. So it's it's saving us money that way, too. Right. And, and, and we've actually, we just ran out of uh, pasta sauce, canned tomatoes. Home, home canned tomatoes, yeah. and we're almost out of salsa. Yeah, and, and pizza sauce we're very low on as well, so we're having to... Uh, so uh, now after, we didn't do a lot of tomato canning last year, but after two years, we're finally running out of tomato and this stuff. and this goes to the point of if you are in the in, in the mindset or the planning of hey I'm going to do a lot of canning what you know we keep a log of here this is what we ran out early on here's what we need to focus on making more of so we don't run out as quickly the following year so keep that in mind so yeah tomatoes we're talking about the heirlooms the big be- the, the the brandy wines the, the beef steaks the beef steaks those juicy tomatoes that we all long for year round uh, inside during the the summer month or during during the winter months. Another one is uh, green beans. Easy, about as easy to grow as garlic. Uh, right. So depending on the pole beans or bush beans, and we'll talk about the time the of the account. year. You can find them okay price, but then at, depending depending on the time of year, they're more expensive. But the nice part about this is you can freeze them. Mm-hmm. Or you can can them too, but we prefer to freeze them. Container, they grow incredibly well. You can actually grow them indoors as well under grow lights or in a, in a window to a certain level. We were able to successfully grow green beans several years ago under grow lights without yeah. any issue at all. But again, you need a lot to, that, you know, it's not like you're going to have enough to can. It's going to be enough for a meal or two uh, when you grow them indoors. But yeah, green beans. Uh, real quickly, bush beans. They take four to, uh, 40 to 60 days to reach maturity. They're going to produce for about two weeks, and then they're going to, that's about the, the production life of them. Pole beans, on the other hand, grow vertically, trellis, anything they'll climb up on, take 70 to 80 days to reach a mature state of production. They will produce all the way to fall. So keep that in mind based on what you want to do. Bush beans, you'll have to replant several crops if you want throughout the summer months. Well, when we come back, we're going to discuss berry plants, berry bushes, What's best for you, or maybe none of them at all, and you just buy them at the farmer's market right after this. Twenty-four seven, three sixty-five. 365 the com has all the gardening information you need. Videos, digital magazines, replays of shows, and more. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh used carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Caterina Bill, open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 278 and online at beansandbarley.com. 
Eco Garden Systems is a revolutionary way to grow food, a fully contained raised platform with a conventional watering system, solar power unit optional. Made from recycled material in the U.S., Eco Garden Systems Raised Garden Bed offers sustainable, organic gardening that is environmentally sound, quick and easy to set up, maintain, and fun to use. Fill your garden with soil and plant your seeds. Your Eco Garden will take care of the rest. Can set up in backyard, patio, and even your driveway, any level surface. For more information, visit EcoGardenSystems.com. Use coupon code WIVEG125 to save $125 and get free shipping. A $250 value on the purchase of an Eco Garden original garden unit available only in stone color. Purchases must be made to the website EcoGardenSystems.com forward slash store. Offer valid through December 31st, 2018. Available to the contiguous United States. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Root Assassin, a garden tool that does all the root functions with its advanced shovel that has serrated edges on both sides. Find out more information at RootAssassinShovel.com. The Gardener's Hollow Leg, the debris and harvesting bag you wear, comes with its own belt attachment, perfect for doing light pruning, weeding, harvesting on the ground or on a ladder, and many other uses. Find out more at TheGardener'sHollowLeg.com. Save 10% by using the word veggies at checkout. Figs are not always considered vegan. This garden fun fact is sponsored by ManureTea.com. Get your three-pack today. Drop the tea bag in water. Let steep, then feed your soil, not your plants. 100% organic. Find out more at ManureTea.com. Always free shipping. Figs are not always considered to be vegan. When a fig tree is pollinated by a fig wasp, the fig flower traps the wasp, and then the enzymes in the flower digest the wasp. Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, retail manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mel's is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, Come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is brought to you by the following. Handy Safety Knife, BioSafe, Tall Earth, Chapin International, The Plant Booster, Ivy Organics, Woodman's Market, Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. You just don't want to lollygag around and take your sweet time. You, you, this is a time-sensitive thing. With your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. You know, when we talk about berry plants, berry bushes, berries, it reminds me back whenever I was younger, I guess you would say that, uh, the church I grew up in, if, if you've gone to a Baptist church, you understand that Baptists like to eat, and we always have uh, food socials or ice cream socials. Holly's just listening to this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and there was a guy that always, there was a, an older gentleman, he's still with us today, I'm from Southern Illinois, and he always brought blackberry cobbler. And that was the, the highlight of the whole food social, the ice cream social. And you'd always calculate, you know, am I far, am I close enough to the front of the line in order to get some? Because, he, you know, he didn't make, you know, pans and pans of it. He made a, a normal, uh, probably like 9 by 13 inch pan of blue, uh, blackberry cobbler. And it was the best. So, you know, you always want to, you know... Th- Try it, Don. That's that's Don. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. You rem- you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. He calls every Christmas and says, instead of sending you a Christmas card, I'm just going to call you every Christmas. I said that works for me. So we talk for you know an hour about all the things that's going on back home. But when we talk about berry bushes, berry plants, is that something for you? Is it? Will it work on your property? And we're going to go over um, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, gooseberries, elderberries, strawberries. 
and find out if it's something that works for you on your property. And again, this does not work for everybody. Yeah, and blue, uh, berries are a great perennial plant that require a, a little maintenance. Uh, uh, so what we're going to start with is um, strawberries, but with that little maintenance. Not all berry plants like the same type of soil. Right. Blueberries have that issue, and we're going to start, we'll talk about that in a moment. Strawberries, there's two different categories or groupings that strawberries fall under. Right. So there's the June bearing, and then there's the ever bearing. And we grow a June bearing. We have, um, I don't know, our berry our berry patch is kind of out of control. But it's because what happens with June bearing is that they, um, later on in the year after they fruited, they shoot off daughter plants, which is basically they put off these, like, runners, and then the runners root themselves, and then it creates another plant. And that's the best way to propagate these plants. Uh, wait for those to root, remove them from that particular location, and transplant them into a new location. That's the best way. Um, and we just accidentally took picked June bearing because that's what we ordered seven years ago. Right. Planted them, and you're, you're, there's bare root. That's what we got. We, it's a bag of all these roots in a sawdust mixture, and you plant them, and they will root. Typically, get 25 uh, in a bag for a couple of dollars, or you can actually go to the the garden center and buy each live plant here in a couple of weeks for two or three dollars a piece. It's much more economically friendly to buy the bare root and wait than to buy, you know, 50 plants at $3 a piece. That doesn't make any sense. And then before you know it, you have uh, a crazy berry patch. But, yeah, so that's the bare root uh, process. And Well, that's the June bearing. That's the June bearing process. They can get fruit the first year. Uh, possibly, it just kind of depends on the variety and how things are going. That is possible. You're the not going to get... The you have to pop the flowers off or pinch them off so the roots get can be developed properly... Doesn't it doesn't make any? It's not true. You can go ahead and harvest that fruit off the plant right away. Um, uh, the June, uh, the the ever bearing. Let's talk about that for people who are maybe interested in doing containers. Is strawberries right? So ever bearing, they bloom. Uh, they fruit three times a year: spring, summer, and fall. They do prefer zone eight or. <clears throat> higher, I guess you would say eight, nine, ten. <laughs> we are in zone five. They do grow, they will grow in zone five, not preferably, but they will. Right, um, and then you do have to prune them the first year. You can, you would, you, what you do is you basically pinch back the, the buds, the first year. Now, the all, first, uh, right, I want to make first sprouting. I want to make clear that all of these are are annual, are, are perennials. They will come back year after year after year with some maintenance. It's just not a plant like a tomato; it dies and then you got to replant again. These will all come back for many years. Strawberries typically five seven years is about your lifespan. We're we're pushing that on our patch that uh, it's it's going on eight years now um, with that. So uh, another and, um, well, strawberries ahead, yeah. are they're lower to the to the ground. They're kind of uh, they're not they're more of like a a plant versus like some of these berries are more of a bush. Right, and uh, you got to be sure you pick them soon because slugs like them. Uh, birds will get any of these if you don't, you know, we've never had problems with birds with the strawberries, but these other berries we're going to speak about, there are bird nettings in which you can wrap or uh, lay over top of them, as well as um, ants like the strawberries, and we'll deal with that question in, in uh, next week when it comes to how to control the ants from eating the strawberries. Another one is blueberries, and yep. this is the exception to the easy rule here with these berry plants. So blueberries need acidic soil. They need a pH of about 4.5 to 5.5. So you can add sulfur to the soil about three months before you plant your blueberries. Yep, you have to check the soil pretty much every year, um, every to every other year to make sure your pH is correct. No matter what, you s- you would have to continually do this over time as the plant continues to grow. Typical pH in your backyard is going to be about six and a half to seven three, average. So th- we're going to have to lower the acidity for the blueberry plants. So you add the sulfur. Um, and you do that, it's a, like a granule of sulfur, and I think it was one pound per 50 square feet or something. You can look that up. But um, you mix it in three months before planting, check your pH, and you should be good to go typically if you add the right amounts. But that is, um, that's what that's what blueberries require. You can grow them in containers. There are some great companies that have uh, worked on compactive blueberry bushes or plants but again that acidity that's what's going to get you if you're why did it die you didn't have the right acidity so let's talk about raspberries real quickly 
They can get uh, two to three, or you want to plant them two to three foot apart. You cut back the canes in the spring uh, to about 12 inches above the ground. You're going to see, you're, you're going to see the, um, uh, now this is all the canes, right, Holly? Right. So you cut them back um, to about 12 inches above the ground. It's the old canes. It's the old canes, not old the canes. new ones. And you're going to see the old canes, the... it's going to be like a bark Right, it's going it. to be. Versus the new cane growth. So you want to trim those back. And you, yeah, you do that in the spring. Um, they like well draining soil, a less damp area. So if you have like a low lying area in your yard, you want to stay away from that. Full sun and they'll bear fruit about one year after planting. Right, most of these plants will do that unless you get like the newer, uh, two year old plant or possibly a more, uh, newer plant from, you know, Blue Mills or other garden centers. And Black- blackberries, now these are not black raspberries, there's a difference. Right. Um, they are four to five pe- feet apart. They get a little bit bigger. But similar to um, raspberries, you want to trim the canes back, full sun. And you do want to try to mulch these before winter. They're a little bit more sensitive. Gooseberries or currants, uh, full sun, partial shade, three foot apart, uh, easily can be grown in containers. Uh, but you need to be at least 18 inches deep. Uh, and they prune back in the winter. The reason 18. Midwinter. Midwinter. The, the deepness of the container 18 because they have a tremendous tap root that root into uh, the soil. And uh, they'll produce fruit uh, in one to three years. So there is some waiting period there. And now, finally. Elderberry is like, almost like a small shrub, yeah. um, small tree. You want to plant them six to ten feet apart. They can grow borderline poor soil, full sun. Uh, first two years, you should just let them grow as they are. Let them grow wildly. Do not prune. Do not bother to pick the berries. And then after that second year, you'll just have a prolific amount of berries. So some of these might work for you in containers, or if you've got a, uh, an area in the yard where you intend to stay long term, that will work as well for you uh, when it comes to uh, berry plants. Or it might just be better for you to find a farm in which you can go p- uh, pick them uh, and get some um during the year. So hopefully that helps with understanding more about berry bushes and maybe what you want and don't want on your property. Up next, we're going to talk to author Todd Heft right after this. Just tuning in, here's what you missed. Why do we garden? To save money and to eat healthier, right? Cheapest crops to grow that are most expensive to buy. Herbs are so easy to grow but cost so much to buy in the little packages at the store. Berries are a great perennial plant to grow that require little maintenance. Blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, gooseberries, elderberries. Not all berry plants like the same type of soil. Up next, author Todd Heft. For full shows and highlights, go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Got a question? Email the show at twbgshow at gmail.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy, homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar, honey, or any alternative sweetener you'd like. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Available at most natural food stores and online. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from Plant Success Organics.com that will greatly increase your plant germination ability and healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponic root cutting, seed sprouting, cocoa core, and soil. Plant Success Organics.com carries powder, granule, and tablet form of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil to give your plant the optimal opportunity to produce incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit Plant Success Organics. Wouldn't you love to get more from your growing space? By utilizing the square foot garden method and properly spacing your plants, Seeding Square will optimize and organize your veggie garden to grow more greens and less weeds. The square foot color-coded seed spacer is a great tool for any garden, ground, container, or raised bed, and all experience levels, even little green thumbs. For more information, visit SeedingSquare.com. Seeding Square is gardening made simple. Tall Earth Wood Treatment All-in-One Preservative and Stain offers lifetime protection and creates a unique silver-aged wood finish. All ingredients are non-toxic, eco-friendly, perfect for garden beds and veg front. Find out more at TallEarth.com. Free shipping on all orders. 
Use coupon code W-I-S-C-O-N-V-E-G to save 15% off orders placed at TallEarth.com. Shield and Seal Vacuum Sealers and the highest quality vacuum sealing products, unique black and clear and all black bags, protecting your produce and product better than traditional bags. Find out more at ShieldAndSeal.com. Zaz Products, offering great quality supplements that can help personal health and increase longevity. Committed to bringing you the highest quality products at the lowest price. Find out more at ZazProducts.com. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at MIGardener.com. Now with over 450 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom, and organic flower, vegetable, and herb seeds available year-round. Pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to MIGardener.com for seeds and garden needs, tools, and special blend fertilizers. MIGardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Haas Tools, Tree Diaper, Root Maker, Seeding Square, Rebel Green, Dripping Springs Oya, Zaz Products, Shield and Seal, Pomona Universal Pectin. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. Well, you guys are like internet rock stars. With your hosts, Joey and Kelly Baird. So, Joey, what are you looking for in a garden center? Well, what I'm looking for in a garden center is is a wide variety of plants and garden supplies and people that know what we're what I'm what I'm looking for a knowledgeable staff that can answer all my garden questions and if they don't know the answer they can go over and ask a, a fellow a staff member that has maybe more knowledge since we're all on different levels of, of knowledge when it comes to plants and, and garden supplies well I have the place for you Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is that place they've been around since 1955 family owned and operated the owner works in the building so that certainly says something no matter the size of your garden need or landscape you need blue mills at 4930 west loomis road in greenfield can supply and surpass all of those needs and that's just south of layton on loomis blue you can call 414-282-4220 well holly let's go to the iv organics 3-1 plant guard hotline and bring in our next guest todd heft is a garden blogger of the big blog of gardening off Author of Homegrown Tomatoes, Step-by-Step Guide to Growing Delicious Organic Tomatoes in Your Garden, and Fellow Tomato Lover. On his blog, he shares advice on caring for your flower gardens, vegetable gardens, and lawn using no synthetic fertilizers or pesticides. Welcome to the program, Todd. Good morning. How you doing? We're doing well. I understand that you're still digging out from several northeasterns up there, and I uh, hope oh, everything's yeah. going well. Yeah, we got we got hammered middle of the week, and uh, it was just a mess here in uh, Pennsylvania. I'm in the Lehigh Valley, which is kind of like right in between New York and Philadelphia. So we were right on the edge of that storm. It was brutal. Um, I, we we we've talked about bring. We will be talking about bringing birds into our garden. And some people think that's a bad thing. Uh, how to how are birds beneficial to your garden? Well, you know, years ago, um, I'm a bit of an old timer but years ago you know when i grew up when we started gardening it was about chasing all the birds away right um and now uh, since i've read a lot of very old school uh books on gardening and farming uh i have discovered that birds are extremely beneficial because they eat the pests they eat the pest insects they're a delicacy to the birds of course we don't want them in there and so what i've done is i've set up a lot of uh you know bird feeders around my property all all over the place and I'll tell you, it's made a huge difference. And and that's the thing, you you, you entice them with the bird uh, mm-hmm. bird feed. You bring them in; they're going to eat those bugs. Now people will say, "Oh, they're poking holes in my tomatoes." Well, I I mm-hmm. contribute that to they need more. They're looking for water. So if that's yeah. the case, add a, add a bird bath, and you're going to have the best ecosystem you've ever experienced in your backyard. Yeah. And my attitude is. Hey, I'm paying them for their services once in a while, right? Absolutely. You know? yeah. It's okay. I mean, I'm growing 12 to 14 tomato plants every year. I mean, I'm taking in bushels. If I lose one or two to a friendly bird who's looking for a caterpillar, so be it. Definitely. So as we approach, I'm about to pro- approach the gardening season, um, for those who are new to gardening or maybe it's their second year or something, what is one piece of advice you'd like to give new gardeners? Uh, I think the, the the biggest piece of advice I give to a new gardener or someone who hasn't done it before at all is don't be intimidated by it. 
I was actually um, in my dentist chair one day many years ago, and the hygienist said to me, oh, you know, I've wanted to start a garden for so long, but I'm kind of scared to do it. I don't know what to do. And, you know, um, as you guys probably learned, probably learned, small children or whenever you started gardening, it's like you just stick your hands in the dirt and go to town. You know, there's no... One thing we learn in gardening is that you do fail, you know, and there's there's no uh, shame in that. Right. And, we, learn, we learn from it. Right, and, and if you don't fail, you either didn't try very hard or you're a liar. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I'd say the latter, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, no matter how hard you try, the weather can sometimes be your worst enemy, you know, and, and I mean, it can take out your, your entire garden some years, unfortunately. And Rarely, but it can happen. And that's what I tell people. We're supposed to get a little, a little warm snap here in the next couple of days, but then it's going to turn off cold again. I'd much rather plant my crops two weeks later than the second time with my neighbor when he plants it the first time. Oh, yeah, but, you know, the garden center loves when they plant early, right? Oh, absolutely. They, get wiped, they, have, they get wiped out and they have to go buy them again. No, yeah. no. Uh, so in gardening, we have a language all of itself. What are some of the more confusing terms us more seasoned gardeners use that may confuse new gardeners? Um, I think maybe, I don't know about terms, but maybe about concepts um, might be the best way for me to approach that question. Um, you know, one of the, I think one of the most difficult things for people to learn is that sometimes you should do less rather than do more. You should add less to your soil. You should pick fewer weeds than to worry about having a perfect soil and, a, and you know, quote unquote, a clean garden. Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, I have found that sometimes my laziest years around the garden are my most productive years. You, you kind of let nature take its course. The weak ones are going to die no matter what you do, uh, try to save yeah. them. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, some, and, you know, one of the biggest mistakes new gardeners make is overwatering. I mean, overwatering can just take out your tomatoes and peppers very quickly. Right, and, and you said you, you kind of let, you add less to the soil and kind of let things happen, but uh, as we know, the soil is the lifeblood of the plants, and how do sure. you build that soil up for that most successful crop, even if you don't have a lot of effort going into maintaining it? I'm all about compost. Uh, I make my own compost, and uh, basically in the beginning of the season, I add a couple inches of compost to the beds before I plant, you know, just really early, like pretty soon I'll be doing that and let it sit there until I uh, put the plants in, and then I add a little bit more. And I, I do use a little bit of organic fertilizer to start the plant, just to sort of build a base. After that, um, there's not a lot that needs to be done. I've taken some courses from Rodale here, which is a, a big organic. Um, they're associated with the universities around here, and they do a lot of studies for the USDA. And their classes on organic gardening are unbelievable because the, they do, you'd be surprised at how little they recommend you do. And and you go see their gardens and they're spectacular. Um, and they're kind of all about making the compost correctly, laying it on there early in the season and then just adding it once or twice more and you are kind of done. Well, let's talk about what what is the right way to make compost because everybody has these, oh, I can only yeah. add X, Y, and Z materials. What, what what do you recommend for the correct compost pile? Yeah, that's a trick. Um, and honestly, that, that was one of the most difficult things that I learned, and I experimented for years um, because, um, as you know, if you put in too much green stuff, it gets all stinky and, and the microbes build up too much. And if you have too much brown stuff in there, too much carbon-based stuff, um, nothing happens. Well, not nothing happens, but a very it's a very very slow process. So, some of it's experimentation because it also depends on where your compost bin is located on your property and how much sunlight it's getting, how much heat is building up in there. So, I kind of um, I I put a lot of yard waste in there. I put my non meat food scraps in there as well, and I I observe the compost throughout the year and see how it's cooking down and I make the adjustments appropriately. Now I've pretty much got my system in place. I know what to expect. I know how much of each to put in there. So it is a bit of an experimental process for a kind of like, you know, science geek like me. It's a lot of fun. Other people may not like that, and they can buy tons of compost. Definitely. So what is one of the biggest mistakes you would say you have ever made 
in gardening, you just <laughs> learn largely from it. Oh boy, <laughs> um, I I was guilty of overwatering in the past, and I ended up creating a situation where um, a lot of fungi was introduced into the garden. And I, I basically, my tomato patch was just about taken out one year. Um, that was very early on in the process. You know, when you have a lot of rain coming down and then you're watering on top of that, it's just a disaster. Um, other mistakes I made was planting um, sun-loving crops in a place where later in the season they might be shaded out by trees, you know, so you get kind of underproduction, and just the opposite, too. Um, an area that's shady in the beginning of the year isn't always shady near the end of the year, depending on how your property is oriented, how your garden is oriented regarding the sun. So, you know, I learned to understand how the sun tracks across my property over the course of the year and I plant uh, the appropriate crops in the appropriate places now. That was one of the biggest mistakes I made. How do you maintain soil fertility in containers throughout the growing season? A lot of people grow in containers, especially in urban areas. Mm -hmm. How do you maintain that soil fertility? Well, the, the main thing is to basically create your planter correctly out of the gate. You know, you have to use a very good potting soil. And you don't buy potting soils with chemical fertilizers in them. I'm, I'm strongly against that because it creates a salt buildup in the container, which doesn't do your plant any good. You know, they start off great, and then they kind of become feeble later in the uh, season. For instance, perfect example is my neighbor. I live in a kind of I live in a city zone. I've got like a quarter acre property, you know, and I'm just like planted out all over the place. My neighbor is was a container gardener for years. He grew his peppers and tomatoes in containers. And he, you know, it's hard for me to say anything to him, but he overwaters, and he was feeding them with chemical fertilizers almost every time he watered. And after two months, notoriously, every single year, his peppers started to droop. He was getting disease. He had very little foliage on him. He couldn't understand what was going on because he looked at my garden and they were just exploding, you know. So I, you know, I gently coerced him over to my way of thinking, and now his crops are fantastic. So the containers, you cannot overfeed your plants in containers, and you should always buy a very good potting soil. You don't need compost in those containers. You just need a gentle organic feed. I always recommend a granular fertilizer. But you do have to feed them very differently than if you were growing them in soil. Well, let's talk about your book, The home, okay. Homegrown Tomatoes, The Step-by-Step -step Guide to Growing Delicious Organic Tomatoes in Your Garden. What is something unexpected that people can learn from this without giving too much information away? Well, there's two things. Um, I actually learned while I was doing the research for the book. Uh, early on in the book, I kind of get in, into the history of tomatoes and their origins. And the first thing I learned um was why tomatoes are classified as a vegetable instead of a fruit. Botanically, tomatoes, since the seeds grow on the inside of the uh, tomato, it's technically a fruit, yet it's classified as a vegetable. Well, I explain why in that book. I also explain where, uh, the, where tomatoes originally came from, and if you think it's Italy, you're so wrong, it's unbelievable. Well, uh, how can people find your book, and how can people find more about you, Todd? The book is available on Amazon, and you can get a link to that on my website, bigblogofgardening.com. Well, Todd, we greatly appreciate you taking your time out of your day and sharing some of your garden wisdom with Holly, myself, and all of our listeners. I appreciate the invitation. Anytime. I'll come back. Absolutely. And Thank we'll, you, Todd. And we'll be right Thanks, back guys. after these messages with your garden questions. If you have a gardening question, now is the time to call in on the IVOrganics.com 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline at 414-444-5250. Are you short on time when it comes to grocery shopping? Yes, I'm talking to you. ShopWoodmans.com offers online shopping for store pickup or delivery, 
on their over 60,000 plus items at Woodman's Everyday Low Prices. Or online, select a pickup or delivery time and create more time to do what you want. Leave the work to Woodman's. Also, check out the shopwoodmans.com app. You can even make special requests like specific sizes of produce. For more information, visit shopwoodmans.com. Hoss Tools wants to help you grow your own food. From seed starting supplies, hand tools, drip irrigation, harvesting equipment, and complete line of all-natural pest control solutions, they've got you covered. Keep your garden weed-free with their time-tested, American-made wheel hose that are built to last a lifetime. And the precision garden seeders have proven design for planting a wide variety of seeds. Hoss Tools has what you need to get the most out of your growing space, large or small. Free shipping and outstanding customer service. Shop online or request a free catalog at hostools.com. An Oya is an unglazed porous clay pot with a short neck and a wider belly. Bury your Oya neck deep in your raised bed, container, or ground garden and let the Oya do your watering by releasing water as needed. How? By soil moisture tension for all you techies out there. This is an eco-friendly, efficient, ancient way to water your plants using up to 70% less water than other irrigation methods. It saves you time and is easy to install. Find a retailer through drippingspringsoils.com. Smart watering, easy gardening. Rebel Green, responsibly made natural products that are good for you and the environment. Made in the USA, plant-based, vegan, and always toxic-free. Find out more at rebelgreen.com. Flame Engineering, home of the Weed Dragon, the perfect propane torch kit for home and garden use. For killing weeds, no need to pull or spray. 100 other uses. Find out more at flameengineering.com. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bobex is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. Bobex deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bobex can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit Bobex.com. B O B B. Here at Outpost Natural Foods, it's not just that we're community-owned that sets us apart. It's the fabulous foods we sell. We celebrate Earth Day every day by offering our customers the finest natural and organic food selections in greater Milwaukee. Outpost local farmers and vendors provide our stores with a delicious selection of fresh seasonal produce that you won't want to miss. Outpost stores are located in Milwaukee, Wauwatosa, Bayview, and Mequon. We're a real Milwaukee original where anyone can shop and anyone can join. For the whole scoop about Outpost, we invite you to visit W www.outpost.coop I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Flame Engineering, Eco Garden Systems, Bob X, Plant Success, Beans and Barley, MI Gardener, Outpost Natural Food Co-op, Root Assassin, Manure Tea, the Gardener's Hollow Way. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, your home for Garden Talk Radio with your hosts, Joey and Holly Bear. You're always welcome to give us a call and ask us a garden question, give us a comment. You can do that uh, by tweeting us at hashtag or at uh, TWVG Show at G, uh, TWVG Show on Twitter. TWVG show at gmail.com or on the Ivy Organics 3 in 1 Plant Guard hotline. Ivy Organic 3 in 1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. Uh, visit for more information, visit ivyorganics.com and you can call in right now with your question or comment at 414. 414- Four 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 fifty two fifty, and we always have questions that come in on social media, email, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and one is this here: Can you please explain to me what it means when it says "days to maturity"? And this is a really good question because it says on the se- the seed packet. We talk about this in our talks. We talk about it on the radio, um, and the answer depends on how you start the seed. 
If the seed is planted straight in the ground, like a carrot seed, then the time to maturity is the time between the planting and the harvesting of the first carrot. If the seed is started indoors and then planted in the ground, well, don't like, don't start carrots indoors. Right, but, but the, we're, we're talking, going to the example yeah, okay. here. All right, I'm just so, clarifying. like, what like commonly like tomatoes, right. then the time of maturity is to the time from setting out the seedling to the harvest of the first tomato, which I kind of knew because growing up we just put our seeds in the ground, all of them. And it seemed like the tomatoes took the same amount of time to develop versus us who start the seeds. But you start the seeds to get a healthy plant start and make sure that each plant you put in is actually going to grow so you don't have bare spots. Right. Yeah. So that's a good question that came in. Um, Another one is, what is the variety of okra you grow? I was always under the impression you could not grow okra in Wisconsin. Well, last year we grew uh, four plants of okra upon William Moss, who is going to be a guest next week on the program, his... Uh, advice, uh, encouragement, mm-hmm. and it grew very, very well, really well. So we grow the Clemson spineless. Right. So that's the variety we grow, and we we grew pretty well. Yeah. I don't really like okra, so I don't. We really dehydrated care, it now. Yeah, we oh yeah, that's right. We dehydrated and it, and it wasn't nearly as you know it doesn't have that slime consistency when you dehydrate it, mm-hmm. and you can put a little dill on it or whatever, season it before you dehydrate it. But it worked really well. Now you don't want to plant okra in containers. That that's because it has such a tremendous deep tap root. It probably will not grow very good unless you have like a container that's got a two foot deep um, capacity. That would be the only recommendations right. on that. So another question came in: Why are you not growing acas anymore? And acas are a root crop <coughs> from they're from the was it South the Andes, America? South America. Yeah, Andes, South America. A lot, but a lot of people grow them in the Pacific Northwest and. We just felt that it wasn't worth our time. You plant them uh, early on in, you know, a little bit, uh, about the same time you plant your tomatoes, or you, somewhere in that range, and then you don't harvest it until preferably the first week in December. Now, for many of us who know what's going on the first week in December in Wisconsin, there's usually ice and snow on the ground. You've got to protect these. You've got to wait for the first frost uh, because they start developing the tubers after the day length short. It's, we, we were able to grow them successfully two years. So we, we know we can do it here, but it's just not worth the effort. Um, they're little tubers. Uh, they have like a lemon flavor to them uh, when it comes to that. Another unique question here um, is... Bamboo is typically an invasive plant when planted in the ground. Is it invasive when it's growing in zone 5 or below? And yes, um, it's, it is. It's, uh, it is a, it a can plant that can here. be grown here. And it can take over, and Joey's friend's father grew some, well, down in southern Illinois, which is a different climate, but still, they it is invasive. He, he uh, thought he'd just throw some in the corner of the yard to grow it, and it was four or five years, and he called, and he couldn't get it away. He dug the roots up, it came back, he'd mow it over, it came back, he reached out to the big uh, weed spraying chemical companies in North America, and they said, well, if our product doesn't work, I don't know what will kill the bamboo. So if you're going to grow bamboo, beautiful crop, put it in a container <laughs> right. uh, if you're going to do it that way. Um, one more. Uh, do we have another question here? Um, let me see here. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, can you, uh, the peat pellets. Okay. People are starting seeds. you got those peat pellets. They're cute. They're convenient. They're, you know, they're expandable. You put your seedling in there. A week later, you're, or maybe a couple weeks after your plants have started, they start to look kind of sickly and poor. It's because you're growing in straight peat. Peat does not have any type of fertilizer or nutrients for that. So they're convenient to use, but you do have to give them some fertilizer. Yeah, supplement them with an organic or inorganic liquid fertilizer, quarter strength of what the package says so you don't burn the plants out, or a manure tea. Those peat pellets are convenient because they are a medium in which to grow in. The seed, use, the plant uses up all the energy in the seed coat, and then it has nothing else but the water that you're feeding it uh, to go ahead and use. Okay, let's keep rolling on the questions here. In reference to the first topic we covered in show one, why not to buy seeds from sites like eBay and Amazon, in my gardener, which is the official seed sponsor of the program, chimed in with with his uh, comment on it. He said, so glad you're bringing this to light. It needs to be stopped. And we certainly agree. And we appreciate our sponsors listening to the program. Um, And we have Brandon. It's just a little... Uh, thing, little feedback. He said, This year I'm growing black crim per your suggestion. Thank you. Uh, black crim is a type of tomato. And, uh, we covered it last week. We covered it last week. Um, he will not be disappointed. No. No. If you grow that tomato, you will not be disappointed. It, it, whether it's hot, cold, wet, dry, that black crim seems to always produce 
for us regardless of the situation. And then we have another positive feedback. You have talked about using cinnamon to pre prevent soil gnats. Thank you so much for the cinnamon tip. I have struggled with soil gnats, and this worked great. And soil gnats is something that many potting mixes or soil starts can contain if they have a soil-based uh, medium. Uh, some of the soilless mixes do not contain that. But if you have soil or compost mix in it or some type of that material, you're going to have good nutrient value, which is going to feed the plants. If you have a soilless mix, and we got some uh, uh, emails this week in regards to what's wrong with my tomato starts, it was because they were using a soilless mix and was not supplementing a fertilizer or a nutrient mix, mm -hmm. whether it was organic or inorganic, and the plants were suffering dramatically, and, so and, and they were needing to be fed. Right. So that tip is, is that when you start your seedlings... You just simply sprinkle a nice just little dusting of cinnamon. doesn't have to be expensive cinnamon, just the El Cheapo stuff. So that and it works very, very well. Uh, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, what would you recommend for clay-rich soil? Well, you can add any organic matter you can get your hands on. Grass clippings is one. No, nope. have... you want to grass clippings, but you want to make sure they're seed-free. So you're not okay. You're, so you're not bringing seeds yeah, seed into it. Seed-free or chemical-free grass clippings, uh, shredded leaves, rotted manure, and compost are all perfect choices. Um, With the manure, you want to know what was right. You want to make sure you know not only where that manure came from, but what that horse was fed and or what cow was, or cow, and what what was sprayed on that uh, lawn or grass. Um, because before, because. As we learned from our friend Joel Lample, that he had some perfectly rotten manure from some horses, I think, and the farmer had sprayed this um, persistent herbicide. Persistent herbicide, a broadleaf herbicide, and even though it went through the process of the digestive system of the horse, and it was rotted, and it was cured or whatever they call it with the manure, um, it still still killed the plants. So that's how strong this herbicide was. So you want to know where, what, the whole thing. Just don't go, oh, it's free manure. Okay, put it in the back of the truck. Let's fill some buckets up because you need to know. it. And if you want to get that well-rotted manure and you do not know where it, what the origins of the whole chain of command is, get some of it, put it in a cup because this rotted manure is going to be basically compost. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then put some bean seeds in it. Bean seeds sprout in four to six days. If the bean seeds sprout and everything looks fine, it's good to go. If there is that persistent herbicide or herbicide on that, those beans are broadleaf plants, and you're going to see they're going to be very disformed, disfigured, uh, curled leaves, then you're going to know there's something wrong with it. So that's a quick way to figure out if you don't know the origins of how to test that soil to see if it's good for your garden plants before you start growing everything in it. All right, definitely. So that's something you just want to make sure you mix it in you um, mix it between the 6 and 12 inches uh, top portion of the soil. Garden fork, or if you want to use a tiller, you can certainly uh, go that route as well. It will, it will kind of uh, fluff your soil since you're adding that and then you're tilling it in or moving it in, but it will kind of compact itself down after a little bit. Well, we are out of time, and we appreciate yours. Join us next week, programming note, when we will discuss what we did wrong in our garden in 2017 and what you can avoid doing so you have a better crop and actually have a crop, uh, as well as dwarf fruit trees, what you need to know if you want to get your own, whether you grow them indoors or outdoors, and we'll cover all of that. And we'll have guest William Moss. He is from the Chicagoland area. He's been with us a couple times last year, very knowledgeable. Uh, we are horticultural expert. Yep, uh, you'll, you've seen him on TV. Miss any portion of this program or want to revisit it in its entirety, you can find that under the radio tab at our website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Specific interviews or certain topics under the highlight tab on the right-hand side of the main page. Till next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. You have been listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, Tell a friend and join Joey and Holly again next week so we can all grow together. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com in association with WI Garden Media Broadcasting, live from the WNOV 860 AM and the W293CX 106.5 FM, Courier Communication Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin.